what should we talk about? Exactly. What, what are we going to talk about? We're going to be talking about good old Raiders of the Lost Ark. So we're, we're starting with looking at posters, and I've got all of the posters there for the different Indiana Jones movies, and this is purely because this episode was going to be about all four movies, but when I got like a couple of days into putting slides together, I realised there's going to be enough for each one. So tonight um, we're just concentrating on Raiders of the Lost Ark, but for all those people who Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls is your favourite movie, we'll get there one day. So the print, uh, the print, material for Raiders of the Lost Ark is quite interesting. It's probably not as diverse as Star Wars was. Um, with Star Wars, the development seemed to go over a couple of years. Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think maybe because there wasn't as many problems in development and they had more of a clear vision of what the movie was going to be about, the print material is all on the same page, except when you get to Poland, of course, because we, we love the Polish posters. But here is um, the local and um, British posters. Uh, there's an advanced poster there in the UK which sort of had newspaper cuttings on the poster, which I find very interesting. I hadn't seen that poster before. But one of my favourite posters of all time is the one in the centre there, um, which was on one of the original soundtracks. I didn't see that poster locally growing up, but I think they used it for the 10th anniversary as well uh, when it was back in the cinemas, and that's when I picked that up. So that's my favourite poster from Raiders of the Lost Ark. The other ones are the classic ones of um, Indiana Jones. Now, the thing that's really interesting about this, and you don't think of this now, this was Raiders of the Lost Ark, and at the time, no one knew who Indiana Jones was. So none of the material is aimed at people knowing Indiana Jones, you know, like the other movies where it's all Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, until we get to the reissues about a, a year later when they start putting Indiana Jones because he's become an icon. And here is the international posters. And I'm sure one day a segment we can get out of um, the show sometime is what is this Pol Polish poster advertising? Because um, when you see the international posters for stuff, generally they use some of the same images as the local or the American releases. Usually the I love the Japanese ones where they take the standard artwork and the Japanese print I just think looks fantastic on posters. But the Polish and the chess ones, I don't know, like they're brilliant and they're terrible at the same time because you cannot tell what the movie is. And often when you've seen the movie, they don't have much to do with it. The... The one down in the bottom left is the Polish uh, one, and it looks like something more Lovecraftian or Cthulhu with this skull with a, a whip going through it or snakes or something like that. And the one above it is, is it's like a, well, it's like all the movie done in like poor comic book. So you've got the truck and the ark and the plane and, and all of this in, in really weird sort of childlike comic book pictures. So they're brilliant and terrible at the same time. Pretty good movie. Um, even today you have the comic book adaptations. Raiders of the Lost Ark is interesting because it was um, a three comic uh, set and it really didn't go on till later. There was the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones, but that was, that, that was later. And it was released as the three individual issues and it was released as a hardback annual with the same story in, and then it was released as a one-shot with a very similar cover to the annual. So there wasn't a lot of comics for Indiana Jones, which is surprising because the continuing adventures is kind of really fits a comic book um, format. You can do crazy stuff in there that you don't have to have the budget for uh, a movie to do. So there weren't a lot of comics for Indiana Jones. And so, yeah, here's, here's some of the art from the issues. Uh, the, the middle one there is a original page that hasn't been coloured. Um, and the thing that grabs me with Indiana Jones, and I guess, I guess comic books did that because I've read a lot of comics and they are gorier than I remember, but Indiana Jones is quite an adult movie with quite a lot of horror and violence, and they didn't back away from it in the comic books. They did heads melting and exploding, torture, um, all the Wrath of God type stuff, it was all there. So it is a good and faithful adaptation of the movie. And the last one we're looking at, the comics, it did it did uh, retain some of the deleted scenes. And it's one of those things where people forget 
when you saw a movie back in the 70s and 80s, you didn't have the video and you didn't have it on TV and you didn't have it on screening, uh, streaming. So a lot of the time you saw the movie once and then if there was a record or a comic or a book, you might read that more. So that version becomes the version that is the most correct version in your head. And the comic book has the deleted scene which shows how Indy uh, got when the submarine submerged, how he got to the island without um, without drowning. And apparently he, he used his whip to lash himself to the periscope that was up for the entire voyage and then um, just cruised along through the water with his head above uh, the surface. Um, we're moving on to the records and the records, um, you know, John Williams was responsible for Star Wars and he was responsible for Raiders of the Lost Ark and the other big one, I guess, of course, is Superman. And I would say they are probably three of the most recognisable themes in the history of ever. Uh, the Star Wars theme, the Raiders theme and the, the Superman theme to the point where you end up, you know, humming the theme when, like I said, you see the title or you see something on TV or something like this. Um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark theme is so good. It has been in print and available ever since the movie was released and it was out on record originally, of course, and then it came out on tape and then it came out on CD and it's back available on record again. So here are a couple of the original releases. So there was the gatefold release, which opens up and there was the single release as well. Um, there's the one on the right there, which has the 10th anniversary poster art on. And that was a bit different because it had dialogue and sound effects from the movie during the soundtrack. Um, so just to clarify, that last thing is actually like a story of the one on the extreme right-hand side. Uh, and unlike, say, the story of uh, records for the Star Wars movies, there was no narrator. They just took yes. the movie and cut it down into the thing, right? And what was significant, because a friend of mine had it, it was the first time you could hear the sound in stereo because, you know, videotapes were just mono back then. No one had stereo systems at all. So if you played this record and put headphones on, you were hearing the movie in stereo and the sound effects were awesome. So the punches, and whoosh, whoosh, it was really, really full on and it was worth it purely just for that. And then we jump forward to, I guess, the, uh, the more modern stuff where on the right there, records and vinyl have come back in a big way. And the interesting thing is there's not a lot of just standard editions. Everything that comes out these days is the limited edition, coloured vinyl, gatefold sleeve, limited to so many in one colour, limited to so many in another colour. Well, they've done that with um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's the gold with black blotches um, release. And I don't really know how that relates to the, the movie. It's a cool-looking record, I guess. Uh, the Japanese pressing is in the middle there, which has the Japanese OBI, OB. Um, and collectors used to treasure Japanese pressings because the vinyl was a better grade. So you'll often see Japanese pressings go for more. And then when they went to CDs, Japanese record producers were very smart because CDs aren't a better quality. So what the Japanese discs would do, they'd put two extra tracks on. So international collectors would still be tracking down the, the Japanese editions. Very smart the way they marketed stuff. And then on the left there, there's a couple of pieces of sheet music. Um, Raiders was popular enough that... Um, you know, you'd get school bands would often do Raiders and Star Wars because it was like a way to get kids interested in classical music, but something that they enjoyed rather than studying something that they were bored of. So there's Marion's theme and the Raiders March was released with really nice colour covers. I, I'm sure you can get the whole score, but those ones were released with um, sort of collectible covers on that people uh, look for. Yeah, exactly right. And Ros made a point about the novelization being done in all these different colours. Sometimes they're in different colours because they're aiming for different markets. So you had the adults version, the young readers edition version, the child's version, the yeah. blah 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 version of one just to sell extra books. You never never know. Well, I didn't I didn't do the the books in this, but I did look at the pictures and they did them in all different foil pictures. So it's the same picture, but they'd have a, a red foil border, a blue foil border, a green foil border, and it's exactly the same. And because it was foil, it looked amazing, but you read it once, then it looked crap because it has all these really bad white lines through it. So this is the the read along um storybooks you know every time indiana jones cracks his whip uh change the page kind of thing so you have the tape as well um which that that one i found a picture of has never been opened but these were very cool and i actually thought that was a really great 
uh, cover for a children's um, storybook as well. And again, inside, it was one of those things where you're buying it for little kids and it's full of people dying and death and headhunters and all this stuff from Indiana Jones, which is which is uh, fantastic, but at the time was probably quite confronting to some kids. And then you can see you've got the limited edition or well, the original vinyl and I think the 20th, sorry, original CD and then the 20th anniversary CD and then the CD box set with all the movies in. So it has been one of those popular um, soundtracks that has never been out of print. And I would agree it is one of those timeless pieces of music that was probably an instant classic when it came out. Now, we looked at this on our Movies Based on Video Games episode, but Raiders of the Lost Ark was the first um, video game based on a film franchise for a home console. Um, we talked about this at the time. It was one of the more successful video games in that even though the graphics are very basic, which was common for the 80s, it did get across um, the feel of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, so you used your whip and there was things from different levels and you came up against Tot and then you got to the Ark of the Covenant and you uh, the, the lid came off the Ark and spirits, which just looked like a spiral line, come out and things like that. And I remember being quite impressed as a, as a kid with this game. Interestingly, there's two different covers for the game. One is the movie poster and one is an original piece of artwork. And I think both of the posters, uh, both of the uh, boxes are pretty cool. And if the um, Atari 2600 was too advanced technology for you, there was a couple of board games that came out uh, for this. And what we were talking about earlier, I think that's the Strenko uh, production art. And you can see it is more of a um, Tom Selleck version of Indiana Jones uh, for that game. And that game is the Raiders of the Lost Ark game, um, which I remember playing once and finding quite baffling and boring. And then the second one that came out, that first one is by Kenner. The second one came out and it was Indiana Jones from Raiders of the Lost Ark. So it was a good way of getting another game out with a different name, but still calling it Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that is obviously Harrison Ford. And that game was more a move around, collect artifacts uh, kind of game that I did have as well. And I found that one more of a enjoyable game. So anyone who grew up through the 80s might have had one of those games. The yellow one on the left was harder to find in Australia. I only got that sort of later at a secondhand market. I do remember the blue one on the right being around um, more in the shops here. And the Raiders of the Lost Ark cards. And I've got to say, I think this was the original way I was introduced to the movie. And this was in the playground where someone would pull out a grubby pile of cards from their pocket and go, look at this. And the cards again showed all these gory scenes. So there was like dead bodies speared through and um, all this crazy stuff happening. And I just remember falling in love with the movie before I'd even seen it because of the imagery and what I imagined it was going to be about in my head. Um, there's a couple of different versions of the cards there. There's the tops one, which are, of course, the American ones, which were 25 cents a packet. And then on the left, um, there's the Scanlon's Australian ones, which were also 25 cents a packet. So even though um, there were different countries and the same cards, we, we they were the same price. Usually American stuff was a little bit more expensive locally. Of course, the Scanlon one are much more collectible because they obviously sell less sets in Australia than they do in America. Um, but the American set is still quite easy to find and you can still find sealed boxes of them on eBay because they must have just, you know, produced warehouse loads. Um, so it is still, if you want a, a set, it is still a set you can buy for a reasonable price on the secondary market and it is a fantastic set of cards. But now we get to what I think a lot of people here are interested in, and that is the toys. Now, the story of Indiana Jones toys is quite interesting because Kenner produced them, but they weren't in the shops till a year after the movie had left the cinema. And Kenner had a big success with Star Wars, and Star Wars they had already been sold on, so they were in pre-production when the movie came out, so they got rushed to the, um, to the toy stores and were the success everybody knows. Indiana Jones was not a success at the toy shops. Kenner didn't pick the license up until it had become a smash hit globally. So that meant for them to produce figures, it took about a year's lead in. And Indiana Jones came out in 1981 and 
the Toy Fair for 1982 was the preview for the figures. So they kind of missed the boat on the figures. The, the advertising for Raiders was a bit more subdued as well. So I don't know if that had something to do why the, the figures didn't do as well. But they did put stuff in the trades that they had got the um, the rights for Raiders and they were producing them. And it was from the people who produced Star Wars, now came Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, you can see there's some pictures from uh, uh, the Toy Fair magazine, which is a trade magazine showing people that are coming out. And the first wave for the first year was basically just four figures. Um, the first year had a couple of play sets as well, but the first things to hit were the, the figures, and it was Top, the Cairo Swordsman, Indy, and Marion. I don't remember them even hitting Mar Meyer or Target or any of the big stores. I only remember seeing them in Venture, which was usually the where toys are sent to die because it failed. I never saw a Indiana Jones or a Marion. I just remember seeing hundreds and hundreds of Top and Cairo Swordsmen I was going to say, why would you do the the swordsman? I mean, he's, he has less screen time than Boba Fett did in The Empire Strikes Back, and then they made an action figure of him. I mean, you would have thought they would have done a Balok or something, maybe because of the color scheme, and he actually has a sword, right? But uh, of all the characters to pick, it's like really, it's like I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. And the the thing that a lot of fans back then and now sort of lament is they never produced just a Nazi soldier. Mm. And that was sort of like a stormtrooper. You know, you could go and buy four or five of them, but you couldn't go and buy four or five Cairo swordsmen because it is a single figure. If mm. if anything, they could have done a generic um, one of the Cairo henchmen with the black turban and the white because you could buy a couple of them, you know, but I think they kind of didn't think it out properly. So basically, if you're collecting this line, that's it. That's the that's the full line right there. Uh, the Well of Souls playset. Uh, the Arabian Stallion, eight figures came out eventually. Uh, the, and then there's the, if you look at the bottom right corner, there's the Belloc, but he was eventually only released as a mail away and didn't come out on the card. I've just put that there. It's a sales sample that, um, you know, is probably the holy grail of the indie line because there was only a few of them carded. And then you've got the map room, the streets of Cairo, and you've got the, the truck. Now, the indie line is good. All the figures are good. You can tell who they are. The Well of Souls playset is one of the best playsets, I think, for kids' imagination that's ever been released. It isn't as big as some of the playsets for other lines like Star Wars or G.I. Joe, um, but it was really evocative of the movie and gave just the right amount of uh, detail and accessories. Um, so these are the first wave that was released. You had Indiana Jones, the Cairo Swordsman, Marion and Tot. Um, what we were looking at in the eBay auction earlier is there where you've got the mail away for um, Belloc in the ceremonial robes, uh, but in Australia he was not available. Oh, you can just see there on the bottom right-hand corner the back of the card, and that's the four-back card, so it has the original four figures and the two play sets that were available. And that's all we got here. As far as I know, there were no eight-backs uh, released in Australia. And you can see Kenner did it on the cheap again because I think Indiana Jones is one of the best um, from its era action figures ever produced. You can see it's Indiana Jones. It's um, more articulated than a Star Wars figure because he bends at the knees. He's got his holster action where he can crack the whip and also draw a gun. But then he was originally started his life as Butch Cassidy. Um, so they basically took a, a figure that already existed and changed the hat on it a little bit. And I always thought the Indiana Jones looked pretty much like Harrison Ford, but that's just the imagination making that suggestion because it was um, originally, you know, taken from other figures. So you've got Butch Cassidy there next to Indiana Jones, and you can see they're very, very similar. Um, so the Kenner toy people were being very frugal in what they could do. Um, used to make their figures the cheapest they could. Um, you can also see there Butch and Sundance had horses and the horse is just exactly the same as the, what was already released before for the, the Butch Cassidy line. And I mean, it works really well. It does make a really good Indiana Jones and the horse works from that scene in the movie. The horses have a galloping action, which is more than a lot of Star Wars figures, uh, you know, the creatures did. So they, they are a really good toy line and it is a shame that they didn't do better than they actually did. But that's the genesis of some of the Indiana Jones toys right there.
so here's the play sets and this one <laughs> kenner were good with this they bucked the trend because whenever you saw figures in play sets what did it usually say on the box dags collect them all or does it come with the figures <laughs> usually it says uh, figures not included, but yep. two of the Indiana Jones sets uh, actually came with the figures, which makes the play sets quite collectible because for people who only want to collect the figures, they've got to get the play sets to, to get them. And they're pretty good figures. You had the monkey man uh, with his monkey in the streets of Cairo play set, and then you had the uh, the well of uh, the map room with the uh, city laid out on the floor, and it was very, very cool. It was kind of like the Transformer um you know, the stats that you could read by looking through the red cellophane. They use that same kind of illusion where they had the uh, the city laid out with different things printed on it. But when you looked through the head headpiece to the Staff of Ra, which was a rose colour, it would show you where the actual Well of the Souls was. So I think out of all the different um, toy lines through the 80s that were related to franchises they really nailed it with what they did every single indiana jones play set is really good imaginative captures the scene from the movie and then as i said before the well of the souls is an absolutely fantastic environment for the figures and the ark of the covenant that comes with the well of the souls unfortunately there's only a little tiny picture there has to be one of the best accessories to come with any three and three quarter inch line ever it looks like the Ark of the Covenant from the movie. The details are amazing. Um, it's got a gold chrome to it, so it looks rich and golden. And if you were playing as a kid, you would totally think that that was the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and then it comes with the stone cover on the top of it and a whole bunch of snakes, which if you get a loose one are always missing. And it comes with the mummy that has the breakaway wall. Um, and it comes with the... The grapple hook that they can come down from the well, and it's the same accessory as the Luke accessory pack for the Atat from Empire Strikes Back. So that's Kenner um, sort of recycling things again. And then the truck is amazing too. It is um, really like the truck from the movie. You can take the back canopy off and you can put the arc in the back of the truck. And there's even a thing on the back of the truck where you can attach Indy's whip. And as the truck goes along, it retracts the whip in. So it looks like Indy is climbing towards the truck, which is a very cool um, play, play, play feature to put into a toy. So if you want to look for a small 80s toy line from a good movie to collect, I would say Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of the best ones. So here's the second wave of figures. Um, you had Belloc, which has to be one of the, uh, his accessory must be one of the hardest uh, accessories to find if you lose it. It comes with a postage stamp size map. Um, and if you lose that, as soon as you take it out of the packet, basically it's gone. Uh, so that one is very hard to get complete. You've got the German mechanic. Again, if I was a parent, I don't know if I'd be wanting to buy a figure who met the fate of walking into propeller and getting turned into jam. Um, and he comes with a uh, a spanner. So you've got Sala there, which was a good a, a good figure, and it came with a, um, a a flaming torch that you could put in the Well of the Souls playset. So at least the stuff was, you know, one thing could fit into another thing. And then you've got sort of a generic looking Indiana Jones with a bazooka. But I think by the time these had been coming out, the line was already not popular. So these didn't sell. On the secondary market, they're still relatively easy to find. They do go for a bit because um, mint ones are getting uh, expensive. But like all um, mass produced stuff, they, there is a lot of them out there. Um, but I think they're a good line. I do think if you were an adult collector, they probably have more appeal now as something you were nostalgic for from your childhood than they did to children at the time. And that would that would be the reason why they're still popular on the secondary market and a lot of people are after them. This is one of those classic toys where it's almost there and there's one thing that glares out as horrible is the 12 inch Indiana Jones action figure slash doll. This is a fantastic um, this is a fantastic figure. Um, the Harrison Ford, they use the head from Han Solo. What is interesting, though, for some reason, they change the colours of the eyes. So Han Solo has brown eyes and Indiana Jones has blue eyes. So I don't know why they changed uh, the eyes. Maybe just so if you had both of them, you couldn't say, hang on a second, this is exactly the, the same. They changed it a little bit. Now, this figure is fantastic, comes with the whip and comes with a leather jacket and comes with a pistol and everything the one thing that lets it down is it has the crappest fedora 
um, that you could ever imagine. I don't know what they were thinking. It's this felt thing that isn't even the right shape, isn't really well made. And the, the thing is, at the time, you know, there were G.I. Joe and Action Men, and they were making uh, hats which would just go on perfectly. But for some reason, they did this felt thing that um, doesn't look like Indy's hat at all. And no matter how you try and pose it and move it to look at, make it look cool, it just doesn't look cool. So it kind of looks like, you know, when he jumps into the river at the start and then he comes out of the water and his, his hat yeah. is all like, if it was if it was specific if it was specifically made for that scene they might get away with it but uh, for some reason no it didn't didn't really work now mm. here is some interesting stuff uh, that's been going around for a while but um, people might not have seen there was a third wave of figures that were being planned and they got as far as the proposals of the original uh, designs for it. So one of them was going to be the Raven Bar, and it was going to have like a henchman, had a breakaway um, a keg of wine that you could open, had a, re a red hot poker and a fire, so a toy that had like torture in it. That's always a good thing. And then it had uh, a breakaway table and some uh, alcohol glasses and, and things like that. Oh, that would have been like that would have been good. It would have been good if it had been in like the other sets where they might give you uh, a base or a wall to put it in just to tie it all together. But that worked because you'd have Marion, Indiana Jones, and Top that you could put in it. The other one, which I think is very cool, is uh, the scene from the start of Raiders of the Lost Ark where you even have a skeleton of uh, Forrestal from when he pops out of the, the wall. I don't know if it would have been a spin around thing or something like that, but it came with a spider web with spiders. It came with the fertility idol. It came with maps and torches. So that, that. They, were, they were the ones that were planned and they would have been a good range. If they could have got them out, I think it would have would have probably not sold too well, but the people who appreciated the line would have absolutely loved them. And as we were talking about earlier, um, in 2008, a little movie called Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls came out, and we will look at that movie. Um, for better or for worse, one of the good things it did, it brought Indiana Jones back into the public conscious and it became very marketable again. And they released more Raiders of the Lost Ark figures for this uh, for the 2008 Crystal Skulls movie than they did when Raiders of the Lost Ark originally came out. And I think this goes to where the toy buying dynamic has changed, where people who grew up with Raiders of the Lost Ark saw these figures and collected them as adults. And I remember going into Toys R Us again in Knox and there was an entire wall that was Raiders of the Lost Ark with all these figures. And I instantly bought one of everything because it was what I wished I could have done as a kid and the toys I wished I could have had and um, they were there and available and they did an okay job. Some of the figures were dead on and some of them were not. Unfortunately, I think one of the things that let it down, I don't think they ever nailed Indy in that they did some really amazing figures and with some, some really amazing scenes, but I just don't think the Harrison Ford Indiana Jones figure, they got a really great one that you could say that's the definitive Indiana Jones. So I still like the one from the 80s better. There's nothing wrong with it. They were obviously released for toys, uh, for kids. But I even think things like the Ark of the Covenant was done better in the 80s. The, the, they did some play sets and the play sets are all right. But I think the ones that they released in the 80s were, were better. It's still a great line. And um, but up the top, there was an unreleased line that was only available at Toy Fair. So the box at the top centre, it had the six unreleased figures that you could get from Toy Fair. I did think I put bigger pictures of them. But in that, what we were asked about earlier, there was a top with a removable head and the head was the melted version. And that would have been one of the greatest toy figures ever. And unfortunately the line was canceled and it was only put out at Toy Fair as a six oh. figure set. And we've looked at the hot toys before, but Indiana Jones is popular enough that he got a hot toy. Now, the thing that um, I don't know a lot of people know when you get the rights to uh, movie franchise you can produce the toys but sometimes there's additional rights and you have to buy right pay for right likeness rights from individual actors and that's only if you are a really high profile actor that has control of what you're merchandised a lot of times you sign that away when you have a movie fortunately uh, Harrison Ford has retained his likeness rights for him uh, not for Star Wars, but for Indiana Jones. So 
when someone gets the rights to do an Indiana Jones uh, figure, they have to pay a substantial amount to Harrison Ford. It's the same with J Jack Nicholson. That's why there's not many Joker figures and a few other actors, which means something like the hot toy comes out, probably only comes out once um, because once the initial excitement of everyone buying it has uh, it's sold out, they don't want to have to then, once the li likeness rights have lapsed, go and pay him another million dollars to produce another line, which might not sell as well as the first one. So we're kind of lucky with um, Harrison Ford that we've got these figures because it's popular enough that they can afford to, to make them. But um, I was always a little bit disappointed with the Harrison Ford hot toy. I think it's really good, but it's not 100% there for me. And when hot toys are recognized as sort of the industry standard for the best action figures sideshow which actually produces hot toys also produce sideshow toys and they have done a series of sideshow indiana jones figures and these are pretty good they're not as good as the hot toy uh they're more affordable they're about half the price and they did release a lot of accessories so there's the sideshow 12 inch indiana jones which comes with a decent amount of accessories and alternate um hands and things like that. But they also produced a really amazing Ark of the Covenant. Um, so if you want a one six scale Ark of the Covenant uh, for your Indiana Jones hot toy, you can find the sideshow version and it works just as well. And it's a pretty good piece. And as we were looking at earlier, they produced a good range of villains. And one of the uh, desirable ones that everyone is after is, of course, they did a melting face top so you can get him with his normal face and you can get him with his um half his flesh melted out and the the blood coming out his mouth and he the exclusive version of him uh i think was the only one that came with the melted head because i have had the standard version that that doesn't and why would you want the standard version if there's an exclusive with a, a melted head? They also produced a Belloc, and the exclusive version of the Belloc comes with the fertility idol and the base that the idol's on. And they also released an Indiana Jones in the German uniform. And I think that one is a little bit too generic. I, I nearly put pictures up, but I didn't. But there are G.I. Joe figures that, you know, are a quarter the price and have more accessories and look just as accurate as, as that did. So... Um, but that's the sideshow line. There's the four figures. Again, Marion's kind of get shafted. There wasn't a Marion figure, which um, there aren't many female figures for the Indiana Jones lines from any of the movies. We're getting through to the really high end stuff. This is the Indiana Jones one. And the Indiana Jones premium format is quite a good fig. It's a quarter scale statue, so it's quite big. But even bigger and more impressive is Indy on the Arabian horse. Um, which goes for, you know, $2,000 plus now. It is quite a big, impressive piece, but um, a lot of people like the big statues. The Indiana Jones, again, is, is good for a statue. I always think they never quite get Harrison Ford. And when we look later at the um, Crystal Skulls, his figures kind of look better then. And I think because they can capture more of his personality just because he's older and he's got more wear to, to his face. Um, but still, um, if you can find one, they're quite hard to get and it is a, is a nice figure and it often comes with um, uh, wear on the jacket, which have started to sort of go with age uh, now. And we're quickly going over to Lego. Again, when Crystal Skulls came out, it meant that uh, Lego picked up the Indiana Jones license and boy, did they produce some, some good stuff. The middle one there is actually a fan built um, scene from the Cairo marketplace, but they released five uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark sets. So they had the Forbidden Temple with the giant boulder and the, the plane with Reggie the snake. And they had um, the, the temple with, again, the Well of the Souls and the giant um, Anubis statues. They had the Streets of Cairo playset where Marion was uh, abducted. They had the Flying Wing, which is a fantastic Lego uh, vehicle, the only thing that's a bit disappointing is the wings are sort of one solid piece of Lego. So you think you're going to build this big plane, but the whole middle section is kind of one one piece. And then they had the the race for the treasure where Indy is on the horse trace chasing down the, um, the truck with the Ark of the Covenant in the back. So all of those are amazingly nice Lego sets if you are into Indiana Jones. And I've bookended both of those with the Lego Indiana Jones game which um, is one of my favourite games. There's a lot of Lego games 
and all of them follow sort of the same format. But Indiana Jones um, was one that crossed over to Lego really, really well. And probably the last game I've ever sat down and completed the whole game 100% um, is the first uh, Indiana Jones Lego game. So we're down to the last picture and I thought we'd um, we'd go back to where we started, which is the start of the movie and it's the replicas of the fertility idol. And they have done some fantastic replicas of this piece, which are taken from the, the studio, uh, the original studio prop. And there were a few different ones, but that one is the one that is um, all gold chrome. I don't know what it's actually made out of. It probably is a resin that's been chromed and then it comes on the display pedestal from the movie. And I would think if you were looking for a nice prop from the Indiana Jones movie, you couldn't do much better than that. So we have a very stern looking man there saying, coming soon, collecting Temple of Doom merchandise. Well, that's a lot of that's a lot of Indiana Jones merchandise, and I had to cut that right down to fit in because there it was a lot. So we didn't do books and some of the magazines associated and things like that. Thanks for being around. It was a extra big episode tonight. I hope everyone enjoyed taking a memory, like a walk down memory lane, um, back to Indiana Jones. Oh.